Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to this uh, seminar on eating in the Anthropocene. Can we mitigate climate change through food systems, which will be given by Professor Jessica Fanzo. Um, this is a hybrid seminar. That means we have quite a significant group online in the webinar, and we have, we have participants here in the audience. We will first have a presentation and afterwards we give you the opportunity to ask questions both to the participants online and those who are present here inside in Bologna. Um, please for the audience, for the participants in on the webinar, ask your questions on the Zoom Q&A. Do not post your questions on the chat. So let me repeat. Please post your questions on the Zoom Q&A. Now, but before, let me now introduce to you Professor Jessica Franzo. She is Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Food Ethics and Policy. She is Director of the Global Food Ethics and Policy Program here at SAIS. And we are very happy to have Jess Professor Franzo with us this year, directly here in Bologna at SAIS. But she's also vice dean for faculty affairs and international research cooperation. So yes, we have her here with us in Bologna, but at the same time, she's firmly embedded and has to handle all those issues for the size community as a whole, including Bologna and including Washington. Prior to from 2017 to 2019, she served as co-chair of the Global Nutrition Report and the United Nations high-level panel of experts on food systems and nutrition. And before joining our university, she held positions with Columbia University, the Earth Institute, FRO, WFP, Biodiversity International, and was advisor to numerous other institutions. She also was first laureate of the Caraso Foundation's Sustainable Diets Prize in 2012. She published extensively on impacts of food systems and particular, including her recent book, which impressed me greatly with the title, Can Fixing Dinner Fix the Planet? <laughs> now, can fixing dinner fix the planet? Professor Franzo, I will certainly buy this book. <laughs> but before that, why don't you take the floor and tell us a bit about it, how we can fix, by fixing dinner, also fix the planet. Great. Welcome. Good. So, yes, this is on. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the Bologna students who are coming and showing up late when it's clearly aperitivo time. And uh, to everyone who's calling in, nice to see everyone. I hope everyone is staying healthy. So I'm going to talk about eating in Anthropocene. Can we mitigate climate change through food systems? Let me see if I can figure out. Okay. So, can you all see that? Yeah, you can. Okay. So, um, I thought first I would talk about what is the Anthropocene and where are we with climate change, and then move on to food systems as both instigators and victims of climate change, the impacts of climate on food systems and diets and nutrition, some of the ethical conundrums that we're facing and then how we should think about transforming our food systems. So the Anthropocene, what is it? Well, it is Earth's uh, most recent geological time period. It is the time period we are in now is being human influenced. We as humans are having profound impacts on every Earth system, be it geological, hydrological, biospheric. And what you see uh, here on the right are the trends since the 1700s up till now. Uh, the top three graphs are showing you greenhouse gas emissions. So carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide coming from fertilizers, for example, methane coming from cattle, livestock, and you see this significant increase. You also see increases in things like ocean acidification, a warming planet, uh, 
tropical uh, forest loss, biosphere degradation. And not only do you see what's called this hockey stick, the upward, but in the last two decades, it's the pace of change, the massive acceleration in degradation of earth systems. And a lot of that has to do with the way we're living our lives. Our, us moving around the planet, transportation use, water use, cutting down forests for paper products, massive population explosion. When I was born in 1971, 50 years ago as of next week, the population was 3.5 billion. It's more than doubled. It's now 8 billion, which is just insane, the population pressure. You name it though, the human footprint has profoundly impacted climate. And some policymakers, some governments took a long time to convince of this, but most countries now agree that climate change is human induced, with the exception really of one country as of last year, <laughs> the United States. Um, so this is the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change report. It came out a couple weeks ago. This report comes out every five years and shows uh, the warming of the planet, the causes of that warming and the consequences of that warming. And it's a very doomsday report, very apocalyptic, and it scares the hell out of everybody when it comes out, rightfully so. But what it shows is that we've seen this increase in global surface temperature and much of that being human induced. Whereas um, you know, you'll hear some arguments in the United States of the climate deniers that it's just these natural ebbs and flows that, go, uh, that the climate goes through and it's not really accelerating. And this IPCC report that comes out every five years constantly disproves this. The science is quite strong, but we still have the naysayers. There's also significant precipitation changes. Some parts of the planet are gonna become wetter and some parts are gonna be drier. This is a 1.5 degree global warming, what we hope the world stays at, but we are very close to, to reaching 1.5 degrees. And in green colors and the, the darker colors, the darker density show you a wetter world. Whereas the brown is showing you a drier world. Two degrees global warming, what we will likely get to shows you uh, increased intensity of, of droughts and floods. And then this is a four degree warmer world, which is, is quite catastrophic and would be, uh, we'd see massive declines in, in all species, including humans. But changes, these extreme weather events will continue to accelerate as the climate warms. And even getting to 1.5, which we are projected to do currently, it's really, um, really will be difficult to, to stay below 1.5. Everything will change and everything is starting to change. And I like this quote, <laughs> I don't like it, but <laughs> it's, this quote is true. The challenge of avoiding catastrophic climate breakdown requires rapid, far reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. So when we're talking about climate change, we're really talking about everything changing. Everything is and will continue to change. Am I depressing all of you a little bit? Sorry. Well, <laughs> it will make it uplifting in the end. So what, what do food systems have to do with all of this? Well, they are instigators of climate change, but also food systems depend uh, on the climate and they depend on environments and they're victims of this change. So just so you all, um, those of you who are in my class have seen this already, this is the food system. Um, and what this shows here in the middle are the components of food systems. You have food supply chains. Food is produced, it's raised, it's harvested from oceans and soils and rangelands. It's then processed, it's packaged, it's distributed to markets. You are individuals, your consumers, most of you, and you bring with yourself to markets your individual traits, your willingness to pay, 
your knowledge, your aspirations, the influence of your family and your friends and your religion and your culture, you bring to markets, restaurants, supermarkets, stores, your, your desires. And this influences your decision-making of what kind of foods you choose. Food environments, these are stores, restaurants, they too are influencing your decisions of what you purchase or order. What kind of vendor is it? What kind of food is available? What's the price of that food? What's the branding? Is it organic? Is it not? Where is it in the store? Is it near the cash register where all the candy is? All of this choice architecture is influencing your decisions in sometimes very perverse ways. And of course, industry knows that. It's these factors are all influencing your diets that you consume and these range of outcomes, environmental outcomes, health and nutrition outcomes, the economy, the global economy, social equity and inclusion. And along the side over here on the left are drivers. These drivers are shaping and shifting food systems in different directions, causing them to trans transition and transform. Urbanization, population pressure, trade, globalization, politics, and food is very political. And so these drivers are really changing and moving food systems in very dynamic ways. So what are the impacts of climate change on food? Well, one thing that is quite certain is that um, uh, climate change will have significant impacts on crop fields. This is showing you in a three degree and scarier world scenario, red is showing you declines in crop yields around the world. Green are bumper crops. So if you wanna be a farmer and you wanna grow crops and you wanna have good crop yields, you gotta to move to Canada or Russia or the Northern Territories. But most of the world will see declines in the amount of food we can produce. So that's one significant impact. And, and most of the models show and suggest this. Also, we're gonna see significant water stress, particularly in areas that are, are growing a lot of agriculture. So this is showing you by 2025, um, an IPCC scenario called A1B, which is a world of significant economic growth rather than environmental sustainability, what is now business as usual as they call it. By 2025, we're gonna see significant water stress and red is showing you the very highly stressed areas. India, huge producer of food, wheat, and rice, right below the Sahel into West Africa, across all the way through Ethiopia. Right here in the middle of the United States, this is big food, this is soy and corn being grown in, in this whole territory. And we're already seeing places in the Midwest struggling. So lots of places will be under water stress or some will uh, be uh, dealing with floods. And climate related extreme weather events like heat waves, droughts, floods, cold spells, will lead to significant crop failures in some of the major commodities like wheat, maize, and rice that a lot of the world depends on. And the models suggest that this will happen at the same time across different locations in what's called the multiple breadbasket failure. This is very doomsday, right? And it's expected that this will hit 2 billion people. All of this can be averted, by the way, if we take action. So um, this is, is pretty solid evidence. And the other area that is going to be impacted is the, is the nutritional quality of crops. So under a CO2 fertilization effect, which is higher amounts of CO2, a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, we'll see declines in certain nutrients in foods like wheat, rice, maize, barley, potato, soybean, vegetables. And we'll see, looking at the map on the right, 20% declines in protein availability, 14, 15% declines in iron and zinc, which are already deficient in the global diet. 
And you can see the hot spots, a lot of the global south, but a lot of countries in the northern hemisphere will also be impacted. So declines in crop yields, potential, potential multiple breadbasket failures, water stress, biodiversity loss, and, and nutritional declines. Now, on the other hand, food systems are contributing to climate change. Our global food system contributes 30% of total greenhouse gas emissions globally. That is a lot. And what makes that really interesting is that the Convention of Parties meeting, the COP, in which the Paris Accord was signed to agree for the world to stay below two degrees, 1.5 ideally, they essentially ignore food. So the COP meeting's coming up. It's coming up in one month, less than a month now. And food is not on the agenda, which is pretty incredible because food is such a contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And where you see most of the attention is on the transportation and energy sectors, which is unfortunate. But when we look at food, 30% is coming, sometimes some estimates say up to 40%. That's from fertilizer use. That's from the kinds of foods we grow. Cattle being a big one, they produce a lot of methane from burping. Um, rice produces methane. A lot of emissions coming from manure and pasture management. Fuel use from some fisheries, the trawling fisheries that are that are scraping up against on the on the seabed. So lots of, of movement there. Land use change from deforestation and of course the movement of food, but but surprisingly less, and 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 food waste. These are all contributing to global greenhouse gases. And when we look at the different kinds of foods that are making that contribution. This is showing you in 2010, which is business as usual, and in 2050, business as usual, of our agriculture system, what they're producing, and the different environmental stresses from that food production. So, for example, the first two sets of bar, the first set of bar graphs is showing you greenhouse gas emissions. You can see that animal products contribute the most in red. But when you look across the other food groups, other food groups are also contributing to environmental stresses, be it land use change, deforestation, water use, nitrogen and phosphorus application, which is also called eutrophication or nutrient runoff and pollution into waterways and ecosystems. It's not just cattle that is producing a significant amount of environmental stress. It's other foods as well, depending on how things are grown and where they're grown. Tomatoes grown in greenhouses, very high greenhouse gas emissions. Lobster, high greenhouse gas emissions because you have to transport it live. Um, cashews, almonds, avocados, massive water stress. So, depending on the food and where it's grown and how it's grown has different environmental impacts. What about the impacts on food security, which is the area that I work on and care about is, is how climate will impact the ability for people to be able to feed themselves. Well, when we look at the data, it shows that uh, under different SSPs or scenarios that climate modelers use, um, uh, this red is the worst situation of business as usual, in which there's no action taken on climate change, just, you know, drive home economic growth without any intent to be more sustainable. And what you see over time out to 2040 is that in this business as usual, we'll have an increase in the risk of people who go hungry. And in the red over here on the right, you'll see that energy calories will become less available per person per day. Pretty, pretty um, um, predictable. But the green, the green and blue are showing you where action is taken. And you can see the significant reductions we could make in hunger and the significant increases we could make in ensuring that people get enough food to eat. So there's a positive story here, depending on the scenario and what actions governments take. 
And we're also dealing with a huge burden of malnutrition. I just want you all to look at these numbers. This is pretty insane. 811 million people go to bed hungry every night. That number has been rising for five years, which is incredible because we saw significant declines for about 20 years. So why is this happening? FAO argues it's conflict, climate, and the economic downturn. 149 million children under the age of five are stunted or chronically undernourished. They're short for their height, like me, but they're cognitively impaired. And the window to intervene to address stunting is really in the first two years of life. After that, the window shuts. Children really cannot reach their full potential as adults. And this is crippling to nations. So when you look at a country like the DRC or Timor-Leste, where 50% of, of children are stunted, that takes generations to come out of. And this is 20% of the world's children. 45 million children are wasted or acutely malnourished. That's when you see micro famines or seasonal hunger. And these children have a very high risk of dying. And 2.1 billion adults are overweight and obese. And that number is predicted to go up to 2.8 billion at the end of this year. And that is incredibly costly socially, economically for societies and puts people at significant risk for other diseases. Many countries suffer from double or triple or even quadruple burdens of malnutrition. You can be a stunted child and be overweight. You can be a stunted child and be wasted. You can be stunted, overweight, and have vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So these burdens that accumulate in individuals and in communities are, are costly. And what we see most of that burden has shifted in the last 20 years from high income to low and middle income countries. So as these economies are transitioning and they're urbanizing, their disease burden is shifting and they're developing more of these obesity and non-communicable diseases like heart disease and diabetes, but they still haven't addressed all of the undernutrition. So these governments get very stuck in how to deal with this catastrophe. And Another concern is that diets are contributing to this. Diets are born out of food systems, so they're very much dependent on the impacts of climate, and diets are meant to nourish us. But the latest data suggests now that diets are the top risk factor of disease and death globally. Isn't that incredible? Diets which are meant to nourish us are now killing us. More than tobacco, more than, more than suicide, more than the opioid addiction, more than high blood pressure, it's diets that's killing us. And what are these diets? Well, they're diets high in sodium, high in sugar, low in fruits and vegetables and legumes, high in mortadella, no, I'm kidding. Um, you know, these diets that are not rich in a lot of nutrients. So um, that's where we're seeing a lot of, of the death with Diets high in sodium being the top killer. And most people now are dying from non-communicable diseases. This is pre-COVID, not communicable diseases. Um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, right? So diets are, are, are big contributors. And what we see is inequities are deepening and plaguing progress. 3.8 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet, meaning a diet that provides their nutrients and is health protective. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, is dark brown, 75 to 100% of the populations there cannot afford a healthy diet. That's incredible. Poor supply chains, food is very expensive, especially if it's perishable. So we have an, equ an inequity issue on our hands. And that came really through in COVID. And we're seeing that particularly in the United States, taking away the vaccines early on in COVID before everyone was vaccinated, they were looking very carefully at risk factors. 
And obesity was the top risk factor for poor health outcomes and higher risk of mortality associated with COVID. It was obesity. We really saw it in the United States, particularly, where obesity is a big uh, epidemic. And a lot of that was associated with the social determinants of health. Who gets access to a healthy diet? Who gets access to health care? Who gets access to physical activity in green space? We saw disproportionately some populations because of the color of their skin, because of their tribe, because of their caste, because of their disability, disproportionately affected by the social determinants of health. And COVID really showed that. So the food system is contributing to this disproportionate effect of, of, of those who, who don't get access to healthy diets. And I think many of you probably participated in this if you were living in the United States, but the Black Lives Matter is really said enough is enough around social injustices and inequity. It's time to, to wake up and realize who's been disadvantaged, who's been purposefully marginalized across every system, be it health, food, education. And so there's a real movement now to change that. Let's hope the politicians are listening. And then last, zoonotic diseases are rising. We're seeing, I've totally depressed. He's like, I'm out of here. I need to go get a drink. <laughs> like, this is too depressing. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> COVID-19 is, is likely a zoonotic disease that's spilled over from animals to humans. 60% of infectious diseases are zoonotic. 70% come from wildlife. Now, why do we care from a food systems perspective? Well, agriculture plays a big role in, in the rise of these zoonotic spillover events because the way we are managing our agriculture systems and growing our food, we're destroying a lot of natural habitat and deforestation. And that destruction or shrinking of natural habitats is causing wildlife to move into closer proximity with domesticated animals and humans, increasing the risk of, of the zoonotic spillover event. And here you see the hot spots of emerging zoonotic infectious diseases of wildlife origin a lot in Asia, and we've seen that over the last several years with SARS and all the COVID uh, uh, family of, of viruses emerging here. And food prices will go up. What we see is um, in a scenario one, which is uh, environmentally uh, conscious, mitigating climate change type scenario uh, with trade, Food prices will go up, but not as severely as when we do nothing about climate change. And that's obviously, there's lots of reasons for that. One being lower yields of foods, uh, price volatility, et cetera. And that's concerning because we see food related protests and riots increase. And we have two great historical examples of that in the last 15 years the 2007-2008 food price crisis and the 2010-2011 food price crisis due to a variety of things, not only food failures, but uh, closing of borders, uh, switch to biofuels in the United States and other trade embargoes. And we saw significant rise in riots and that creates social unrest. Hungry man is an angry man. And um, there's very much a strong link between uh, conflict and food insecurity. And of course, with that, all of this comes migration. People are moving. They're getting out of harm's way. It's too hot. They can't grow food. There's conflict. They move. We're seeing right now in the United States, the thousands of miles Haitians are moving upward because of a climate-related natural disaster. Um, we see this Latin America is moving upward because uh, of, of severe droughts and the inability to feed themselves. And this will continue all throughout Europe and, and everywhere. We will see and continue to see a lot of climate refugees. So I'm gonna just touch on a couple of ethical issues before we get into solutions. So what are some of the ethical challenges that we don't really know what to do with? These are sort of these intractable debates that spin around in circles. 
and, and people just don't have a solid answer for them. Well, one is the question of who suffers the consequences of the world's dietary choices. Energy intensive lifestyles, diets of some populations, particularly in high income countries, they will contribute more to climate change. But the economically poor households will be the ones who disproportionately suffer from those choices. So it begs the question of, do we have the right to eat wrongly? If you consider yourself a world citizen and that our global food system is connected and your decisions matter, it's a question. Do you have the right to eat meat at every meal? Do you have the right to drive a big SUV? You know, these are the big questions that, that we're dealing with. And even here is showing you predicted damage out to 2080 with climate change. And you see in the United States, who's disproportionately affected? The southeastern part of the United States, the poorest part of the country. And, uh, you know, we in New York and D.C. are going to be looking down at down down at our neighbors and saying, I can't believe this is happening, like with Katrina, like what's going on? And, and, and sheer surprise, right? And some countries and individuals need to make much bigger changes to their diets. This is showing you animal foods consumed per day. Look at the United States compared to Iran, Kenya, Cambodia, Senegal, Ethiopia. We consume a lot of meat. So does the UK, so does Brazil. Do we need to eat so much meat every day? We're eating 10 times the amount of meat compared to Ethiopians. It's incredible. It would be great to put the bolognese here, see how much meat they consume. It's, it's hot. It's got to be high in Bologna, particularly. Um, but this is very kind of natural progression, right? As, as economies grow, as, as income uh, increases in households, people want to consume more luxury foods. And meat is one of those. It's tasty, uh, adds to a meal. And you see this, this is your classic meat consumption with GDP growth. This is Bennett's law. It's an agriculture economics law that as people get wealthier, they diversify their diet. Classic, right? So how do we reverse this trend when this has been the trend forever? A second uh, issue is what are the implications of raising meat for consumption when so many people are going hungry? Cattle takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of feed. It takes a lot of land compared to even smaller animals like chickens. If half the world's cereal production is being used to feed animals, is that the right uh, way to use a resource when we still have people going to bed hungry, having such an intensive system? So that's a question. And when we look at the agriculture system, Habitable land, 50% is being used for agriculture. And of that, 77% is raising livestock alone for red meat and dairy. That's incredible to have that much of our land going towards animals, but they only yield 18% of calories in our global diet. So there's a real inefficiency going on here with the way we're utilizing resources. And the biggest driver of, of deforestation is beef. More than oil seeds, more than paper, it's beef. And you see most of that in Latin America, particularly Brazil. And that's why you see the burning of the Amazon, the slash and burn agriculture. They're just clearing forests for cattle to graze on. And, and it's a huge economic incentive to do that. And so how do you incentivize an alternative? That's the question. Just like Afghanistan, how do you incentivize farmers to stop growing heroin? Or have them grow wheat, which they get a hundredth of the price? How do, you, how do you change these incentives? One thing that we did as part of the Eat Lancet Commission, which we came up with this planetary diet. It was a very controversial diet. And it was very plant-based and that's why it was so controversial. It recommended very little meat in the diet, eating meat maybe once or twice a week. And 
a lot of us got death threats and hate mail for like a, you know, a year when we put this out. But this graph is showing you what would our agriculture system look like if everyone were to eat this eat lancet plant dominant diet. Not vegetarian, but pretty close to it. The yellow is showing you by 2050, our diet as it is, business as usual, keep wasting 30% of all the food we produce. We waste 30% of everything we produce. And it shows you across food groups what our agriculture system looks like. A lot of poultry, you can see. The green is if everyone were to eat the Eat Lancet diet and we cut food loss and waste in half. So no increase in cereal production. Our entire agriculture research and development invests in cereal production for feed, for animals, and for human consumption. We'd have to increase 75 and 50% our fruits and vegetable yields to meet needs. Right now, if the world were to consume the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables a day, which is 400 grams, we do not have the supply of fruits and vegetables to meet the world's needs if they were to follow the dietary guideline of the World Health Organization. Fish, 50% increase that have to come from aquaculture because we've stripped out a lot of the marine resources wild in the wild. Legumes, 75%, nuts, 150%. And fish is the same story. The US dietary guidelines fish recommendation would outstrip the world's marine resources eight times over in one year. So our supply right now doesn't fit with a healthy diet. And the kicker is the red meat production coming down 65%. This is why we got death threats from the livestock industry because essentially, the livestock industry and sector would collapse uh, if people were to eat the Eat Lancet diet. And that's what some of these uh, companies want to do is just completely disrupt the system, those that are producing alternative proteins. I work a lot with pastoralists in northeastern Kenya, and they are very constrained from climate. Uh, this is the Turkana, a very marginalized pastoral community, and Barana, the most, the most powerful a pastoralist community in Kenya, you can see he, he's carrying a gun. It shows you sort of his wealth here. And these populations are very constrained from a climate perspective. The other issue is what options are ethically permissible, acceptable and affordable? Will people eat insects? Will people eat lab grown meat? Will people wanna eat these highly processed alternative proteins, the look like meat, smell like meat, bleed like meat, but it's not meat alternatives. Um, for some populations, absolutely not. We, the cicadas in DC came out and I was giving a couple of interviews on NPR. I think that was the little logo is the cicada for this talk. And um, that CNN came into my house and we were cooking cicadas to consume. I got, again, I got so much hate mail from, from yeah, like, it's, it's funny. They're very tasty, actually. Um, and many people around the world eat insects, different forms of them. Uh, but but uh, yeah, it was it was a, it was a pretty funny situation of this brood X that came out. All these cicadas emerged, and and we were promoting eating them, and people were just completely disgusted by them in the United States. We did a, a, an interesting project asking consumer U.S. consumers to sort forty two foods. Sort them in any way you want. We didn't tell them how. You could do it by consistency or nutrient. And naturally, Americans sort by food groups because we grew up with the food groups. And we gave them 42 different kinds of foods. And when you look more closely, they couldn't really sort pizza or, or ramen noodles, which is interesting. But what, what they couldn't sort was the alternative burgers and lab-grown meat. They didn't know what food group to put it in up there with plant-based milk, ramen noodles, and macaroni and cheese, <laughs> like non-food foods. So it's interesting to see how, how US consumers are thinking about these foods. The other kind of neglected area, blue foods, uh, seafood, right? It's kind of a neglected thing that people are not focusing enough on, but has 
great promise. And this is showing you the range of seafoods and the concentration of zinc in these foods and greenhouse gas emissions. And if you look just at the top bivalves, that's mussels, oysters, clams. You guys can have vongole. Very rich in nutrients, very low greenhouse gas emissions. Oysters, mollusks, all of those um, are incredibly sustainable and really nutrient rich and could be potentially be a future food that people focus on. And then the last ethical issue is about power. When you think about the food system, who controls it? Who's governing the food system? Is it the government? Is it individuals? It's largely private sector. And when you look at this graph, this is a barbell where you've got 1.5 billion farmers and producers, and you've got 8 billion consumers. And along the middle of the supply chain, you have this incredible consolidation and concentration of industry where 10, 11 transnational companies are controlling the entire supply chain at each step of the way. 10 companies controlling distribution or less, five companies controlling retail. And you see this buying up of companies. What was Monsanto seed company is now Bayer. It's even bigger. And you see that on the input side, on the agrochemicals and seeds and all along the middle of the supply chain. And this is problematic because they have incredible power. They are feeding us, sometimes not very well, and they're not really being held accountable. So how do we get balance across the food system and get governments to better govern their food systems? Big, big issue. So now that I've totally depressed all of you, I'm gonna talk about what we can do. So um, this is a quote by Joan Didion. She's an author, some of you may know her. It's easy to see the beginnings of things and harder to see the ends. I feel like we're a bit in that situation right now with climate. We know what's happening, same with COVID, right? We saw it coming. When does it end and how will it end? And that's, that's the big question that we need to contend with. So when I talk about food, food system transformation, what am I talking about? Well, if you look at the UN Food System Summit that just happened in New York, they really came up with four areas. One is ensuring healthy, nutritious, equitable diets, safe diets for everyone, producing them from sustainable food systems, Promoting uh, equitable livelihoods, about 4 billion people work in the food system, formally or informally, and we want to benefit nature. But when you ask people what they want to, their food systems to transform to, people will say lots of things, you know, community, reciprocity, generosity, sovereignty, love, someone wrote love. Um, people have different visions of what food system transformation means. And we have to keep that in mind. Food means a lot of things to a lot of people. One thing with the transformation that we have, we're kind of running out of time. The window is shutting. Um, the hourglass is draining. And we need significant, bold transformation, big changes. We need government to really step up and instead of the kind of tinkering on the edges. So one thing we know, I'll bring up 10 points and then I'll end. Um, business as usual approach to food systems is not sufficient for the Paris climate change targets. We need to increase yields of food, half food waste, have uh, produce healthier nutritious foods, healthier calories, more sustainable on farm practices and more plant-based diets around the world. Now, if we did all of these at half, half the amount, we would get to the 1.5 degree target for Paris. If we fully embrace these areas of innovation, we could actually mitigate climate change. So without doing this, without doing all of these things, we won't meet the Paris Agreement. If the world went all renewable energy, and everyone drove an electric car, we still wouldn't meet the Paris Agreement without dealing with food. So 
So that's a clear uh, siren call there. We have political momentum. We had the UN Food System Summit, the first time the UN focused on food. Um, the event itself was a little strange, but there was a lot of important uh, actions taken leading up to the summit. And we have a lot to do now after the summit to, to hold our governments to account. We have more knowledge than ever before. We have many historic examples where information and data and evidence has been handed to governments and they did nothing. Climate change evidence has largely not changed in the last 40 years. The IPCC diligently puts out these reports every year, but the models have not changed much. Scientists presented this data to the United States in 1975 and they did nothing. Can you imagine where we'd be now if the US had taken action 40 years ago as the largest greenhouse gas emitters on the planet? Same with a space shuttle Challenger. You guys are too young to remember this maybe, but this exploded upon liftoff. And NASA had a lot of evidence that this was gonna happen. And they still wanted to um, launch the shuttle for media purposes. Um, and this, the, the, this essentially ended the space shuttle Challenger program, space shuttle program. Um, and of course, uh, I think seven, seven astronauts died. Um, but again, lots of information and evidence and no action taken. So we have a lot of knowledge. And, and one of the things that we've done is created the food systems dashboard that helps policymakers understand how their food systems are performing and what they can do um, to take action. There's tons of innovations to mitigate and adapt climate change in food systems. This long list are all of the things that we can do. The dark green shows high confidence that it could mitigate or adapt to climate change. We just need to invest in it and scale it up. We have a lot at our disposal. We have many tools to protect us and the planet. Technology is gonna be important you know, robotics, drones, GMOs, lab-grown meats. The question is what will be ethically permissible, distributed in fair ways, and not cause future harms? So there's a lot of question marks around technology. But when we look in the past, and for all of you who have made quite sad over this presentation, the world has suffered from really severe situations where there's been times where humanity didn't think it could climb itself out of them. And through innovation, creativity, sometimes technology, we've been able to, to overcome these challenges. So when humans decide to come together, cooperate and invest, we can overcome really significant challenges. We saw that after World War II. We saw that after about 1.5 million people died in India during the famine and we had the Green Revolution, definitely had consequences, but it, we've never had a massive famine since. We need to address what constrains higher prioritization of food system and politics. These recommendations, technologies, innovations won't really stand on two legs if we have a fractured and sclerotic global political enabling environment. We have to deal with political polarization, geopolitical competition. We need more multilateral cooperation. When the United States turned their back on the World Health Organization at the beginning of the COVID pandemic was a clear signal that the US was not interested in multilateral cooperation. That was devastating for the United States. When we left the Paris Agreement and we completely removed ourselves, we, for a long time, will suffer the consequences of that because for four years, the largest greenhouse gas emitter per capita took zero action on climate and actually made it worse. That devastated our reputation internationally in climate meetings. And you see that, that the US is, uh, 
sort of has the dunce hat on right now and is being ignored a bit. And, you know, we've got these big mega trends that we need to deal with. And we can think about fixing food systems, but we'll always have to be thinking about it in the context of political uh, issues. I mean, you are all taking a lot of uh, poli sci classes and, and always thinking about these different systems, whether it's the global health system, food system, they all sit in this body of these mega trends and risks that we need to deal with and, and how we handle those. Um, when we think about fixing these things, we can come up with technologies and innovations, but it's kind of the harder stuff that doesn't get fixed is often ignored, like developing capacity to work on systems thinking, cultivating movements, coalitions, networks, like a youth movement in food, championing human rights and equity, balancing power asymmetries. These are the things that often sort of get left to the side, but are starting to be difficult to ignore as uh, our system becomes more globalized. Youth elders and smallholders may save our agriculture system. Elders have information on their side. The world's average, uh, the world's farmer, the average age is 62. It begs the question of who's gonna feed us, right? As we urbanize. But they have a lot of, they have a lot of knowledge and we have a lot of young people who are doing really innovative stuff and starting to come up, but not enough. Um, on the consumer demand, we've got hard policy options to soft poly policy options, hard soda tax, make it hard to restrict choice, right? Or eliminate choice, soft education, uh, nudging, putting labeling on menus, things like that. So we have a lot of, of, of information, but we also have to remember what's, what are people eating? They're eating a lot of highly processed packaged foods. That's what the world is eating. Really cheap, really tasty, really convenient. We're all eating it, right? There was a great experiment done by Pepsi. They put in a corner store, a banana and a bag of potato chips, and they put it in the same place, right in front of the cash register, same price. 99% of the time, people chose the potato chips because they just taste better, right? And that's, that. there's something to be said about there and hard to change, right? And you see this ultra processed foods, ultra processed drinks, you see them rising everywhere. This is showing you Latin America, um, you know, Central, Eastern Europe, North Africa, Africa. And we also don't know the environmental impacts of these foods, the plastics used in the packaging of these foods. So this is a big, big issue. And these ultra processed foods are, highly linked to, to poor health outcomes. One other thing we've got COVID to learn from, that was a health system shock and it impacted every other system on the planet. So these systems are in a societal dance with each other. A shock to one system impacts every other system. But the food system actually held up well during COVID. Trade stayed open, food, flow, food was moving, the biggest lesson was supporting and protecting food system workers. You know, they didn't get vaccinated. They didn't have any protective equipment. Um, they were not paid enough. And we, they were feeding us during the, the pandemic. And that was one of the biggest lessons learned. And then last, those of you who are going into research, don't give up on doing research for, for those of you who are interested in this. Um, we're at a time where facts and evidence are being scrutinized or completely disregarded by policymakers and business leaders. But research can chart a very positive path and, and can bring about wholesale changes to attitudes, political thought and action. And I hope you all remember the value of, of evidence and research, which is why we sit in academic institutions turning out that information in the hopes that it does make a positive change. And I will end there. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much, Professor Franzel, on these uh, perspectives. I think it gives our student a large task, a challenging task for the future. You also have to tell us tonight before we leave what we can eat tonight in Bologna, <laughs> but we'll postpone that question. Let me just open the floor for questions. We have quite a big group uh, on online participants. So please list your questions on Zoom Q&A. And while I'm waiting for the questions to come in, please, in the audience, uh, anybody who wants to ask a question, raise your hand, then introduce yourself and tell us what country you come from. So I already have one question online, and that's from Saja. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing that name, stop it. Uh, if we are able to mitigate GHG emissions only after the two Celsius threshold is crossed, will the global climate patterns revert back to what it was in the past? Or will the increase in extreme events and shift in climate patterns stay with us as the new normal? Mm. So as the world warms, and continues to warm beyond two degrees, there'll be a point where earth processes will take over. And then we, it's sort of out of our hands. And in an attempt to try to cool itself off, the world will warm further. And then there's kind of nothing we can do about it. So we're gonna hit this two degree threshold. And that's where, um, we're no longer really in the driver's seat. And so you'll see this, this further warming, right? And it becomes, it's gonna be difficult to reverse at that point. So unfortunately, sorry to be doomsday, but it is a real situation. I mean, we, are, it, we have done so little on climate um, and continue to not do enough as you all know, and I know you are all deeply worried about this, but um, that is why the next decade is so critical and you hear, you know, Michael Mann, Jim Hans, and all of these climate scientists basically 24-7 on news trying to get their messages out that this is the decade to, to make a difference if we don't want to really be in a situation where we can't make a difference anymore. So, yeah, the new, but you are, we're already seeing the effects, right? We're seeing extreme weather events. The last 18 summers have been the hottest summers on record. Um, there was just an article that came out in Nature today that cyclones are going to get much more violent over the next five years with climate change. And it's just that how much more evidence do we need, right? And how, how many times do you need to say it? So. And there's another question on, hmm? online. To what extent do you think that the sol solutions to mitigate emissions from our food systems might affect welfare distribution between different actors, especially mid and upstream in the value chain. Is there already scientific evidence on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think one of I'm not sure on the the upstream and downstream. I mean, obviously, farmers will be significantly affected and, and ranchers as well. And I think most producers in the world are incredibly worried about, about climate and they are a bit more on the front lines of the vulnerability around weather patterns and extreme weather events. Um, that, that said, I think every actor in the supply chain is going to be impacted if, if, if commodities are not there um, and uh, everything downstream is, is then affected. On the, on the who, those that are small and medium enterprises or what's called SMEs will be more significantly affected than the multinationals because these multinationals are thinking about risk and how do we mitigate risk in their pipeline. Um, so it's the small holders and the small and medium enterprises that work in the middle part of the value chain that will be, of course, disproportionately affected because they just don't have the buffer to, to be able to withstand some of the shocks that they might see downstream. 
So, but smallholders will be incredibly vulnerable. I mean, they are relying on rain fed agriculture, some with no electricity, you know, hand, hand pulling, sometimes only working with one crop. Yeah, really, really vulnerable. Do we have any questions here in the audience? Okay, can you please uh, say who with your name and where you're from? Hi, uh, thank you so much for, for the talk, uh, Professor. Uh, I'm Sam, I'm from uh, New York. Um, I was, uh, I had a question specifically on uh, like meatless meat alternative mm -hmm. options, like the Impossible Burger, Beyond Meat. Um, what do you see as the, the, their prospects for, for changing food systems? You know, it seems like um, people across the world aren't gonna stop eating meats right mm -hmm. at least not not to to the scale so do you see like these kind of meat alternatives in like fast food joints like mcdonald's or burger king being a a, a viable way forward yeah it's a great question yeah and there's a question exactly which falls in the same line it's from adam a former student of mine and i'm not sure whether he's having dinner right now in bologna or lunch in the united states but it says thank you as always for the great information professor Franzel. As you mentioned, food and culture are intertwined. What would you suggest as a strategy for how experts such as you and others can shift to, to shift people's eating habits away from overconsumption of meat, dairy? I'm sure it's a delicate balance. That's Adam Guarneri, my That's TA. Adam, Adam, you're not. I'm not allowed to answer your question. No, I'm kidding. I'll answer it. Oh, in a second. Your TA. Okay. So okay. on the on the meat substitutes. Um, the, it's a complicated question because those tech companies are trying to completely disrupt the the livestock and animal systems, whether it's just eggs or any of these, right? And if you you know if you listen to what they talk about, they want to eliminate livestock from the planet. Um, so one, I think that that's quite far off. I mean, maybe that could happen if if <laughs> if we really see declines in crop yields and people have to shift but there are so many livestock systems that the global south depends on um you know what would happen to east africa what would happen to the sahel what would happen to um mongolia there's so many pastoralists and 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 communities that rely on on livestock and i don't see those products disrupting into those populations, at least yet. Um, but I think that the they need to do a lot to improve the products. I don't think they're very healthy. You know, some of them have 15 to 20 ingredients where a steak is one ingredient. So some feel that it's not healthy. They're very highly processed. But it is, they can be important if you care about animal welfare or if you care about the environment and you care about greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I think it really depends on what the consumer values. I also think the impossible burgers, which they're already selling in Burger King, et cetera. Um, I think that they're great for those who crave meat, but care about animal welfare and and the environment i don't think for vegetarians they're very a very good option i think vegetarians would rather just eat plant foods right whole wholesome whole grain whole legume plant foods um but yeah i mean the, the technology is going to get better and better they're going to get less processed um so we'll see but that's their intent is to completely eliminate livestock. That makes meat companies like Tyson incredibly nervous, hence why they're buying stock in these, in these companies. And the price point of these foods will come down. Right now they're very expensive, but it'll come down. The more the demand, it's already coming down. The more of these tech companies, the more competition, the better the products, it'll come down. Um, to Adam's question on culture, I don't think you can change culture. I think, I, I have no intention of changing culture, Adam, but I, it's interesting what changes consumer behavior. And when I was growing up, and Arna, maybe you remember this, 
we used to drink whole milk when we were young. And then in the 80s, when fat was bad, which was the wrong message, everyone moved to skim milk. When we first started drinking skim milk, it was like, oh my God, this tastes like water. This is disgusting. Now, with some of us who grew up drinking skim milk or very low fat milk, it is very weird to drink whole milk now. Just talk about a big behavior shift of a commodity that many Americans grew up consuming. Gluten, totally demand-driven issue of gluten intolerance, or I don't want to eat gluten because I want to lose weight. I don't want to eat gluten, even though I don't know what it is. <laughs> you know, that all of this sort of demand-driven has created a complete shift in supply to the types of products that are on grocery stores, gluten-free menus, all the way down to the wheat variety of trying to breed out gluten from wheat. That is incredible. That is a massive behavior change shift of pretty much a whole macronutrient in the body that the body would use. People are eliminating carbohydrates because they think carbohydrates are gluten, which is not true. Um, Talk about a behavior shift. Incredible. And supply is completely meeting that demand. So I think cultures, people's behaviors shift with trends, what social media might say, or what their religion or culture dictates. And it shifts the social norm. Whether or not it's the right shift or the wrong shift is 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 up for anyone's interpretation. But I think a lot of, of um, there's a lot of good examples of, of where people have made big shifts and, and, and a lot of that's due to popular culture and what people read on in, in social media and things like that. Yeah. Yes, we take the question here in the audience. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Martin. Um, I'm both Peruvian and German. Um, my question, well, it seems to me or it strikes to me that the, a, a lot of the debate around food systems can be divided into demands in terms of consumer choice. And um, the, on the other hand, you have demands in terms of government regulation and what governments should do to sort of change the way consumers mm -hmm. uh, cons well, consume uh, um, food. Um, I, I, I'd be interested in knowing if you consider that maybe there is a wrong focus, if, if this dichotomy is perhaps wrong, or if perhaps there is a, too much of a focus in one currently. It's either consumer choice, uh, a focus on, 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 you know, maybe everyone has to try to cut meat and perhaps on the other hand, government, uh, or perhaps there is a focus on government uh, and, and in terms of they definitely have to regulate I, I, since I don't really know so much about the debate, yeah. but I've, but I've heard both sides. I'd be interested in knowing if perhaps you consider there's too much of a focus on one. Oh, such a good question. I mean, I think it depends on what kind of commodity you're talking about. So let's say if you wanted to reduce meat consumption in the United States, how would you do that? Right. Putting a, a red meat tax is could be considered regressive, and it may not. It would never. Pass. It would never pass in the United States. I mean, it would just like fall into paternalism, and it, the livestock sector would undermine it. I think, but um, but you do see things like soda taxes, and and um, and and that's being uh, really replicated everywhere. I think it's sort of a mixture. What, what you often see is that even in the nutrition world and food security world, people will say, um, we can't really change people's diets. We can't be paternalistic. We can't regulate what people eat. It's up to them to make their own choices. But then there's no sort of governing of that choice, right? In the sense of we've made it really hard for people to eat healthy. You know, there's junk food everywhere. You can walk into a hardware store and find food. A bookstore sells food. Every, food is everywhere. It's totally unregulated. 
And it's really difficult if you have a hard time making healthy choices or you can't afford healthy choices or you don't have a lot of choices, period, because of where you are or who you, you know, where you live and, and, and um, you know, what your, what your socioeconomic status is. So I argue that government should regulate industry and when industry is not doing well. Um, so for example, a great example is Chile, your neighbor. They put a warning label on the front of packages, these black stop signs, if a, a food was high in sugar, salt, and fat, right? One, two, three, if it was all three. And that alerts the consumer, okay, this is a high sodium, high sugar food, and I can make the decision if I want to purchase that or not. And what they found was that in Chile, after two years, the purchases of those foods with the black stop sign went down 27%. But Chile took it one step further. They regulated those foods. If you get a black stop sign on that food product, you can't sell it in a school or near a school. You can't advertise it on TV. Right? So they regulated it. So what did industry do? You don't want that stop sign on your package. So they reformulate. They try to get the sugar and salt content down. So it was a, a regulation of industry, but an incentive for industry if they chose to take on that challenge. And it was informing consumers. So that's a really great example of where, and they're doing, Chile has been doing a lot, as is Mexico, on softly nudging consumers, look, this is not healthy for you, but then regulating industry to make changes. So it's a kind of one of those examples that's really nice. Meat is tough because meat can be healthy. So can you tax a healthy product if it's consumed in lower amounts? No. Can you tax soda? Yeah. There's nothing beneficial about soda except pleasure. <laughs> but you know what I mean. I mean, it's so it's a, it's a problem. One last yeah. question from our online audience, which fits very much in what you just said. It's from Pientje Bure, and it says, when we see all these global challenges, intuitively you think of global governance to solve everything from above. But on the other hand, food systems also are very regional. Where should we mm -hmm. focus our attention on at this point, regional activities or global campaigns? If you had to choose, what would be more important right now? Yeah, to some extent, great question. I mean, obviously, right I would say both. But if I were to make a choice, I'd focus on cities, mayors. You know, we've got that's where we're seeing the most action and the most interesting innovations. Um, you know, like all the soda taxes are city level in the United States, for example, or even in Europe. Um, a lot of, of mayors are working on sustainable food system policies. So to me, I would focus at the municipal and even community levels, working with schools, um, you know, working in impoverished neighborhoods to bring back food justice and working with, with mayors and cities. That's what I would choose. The global governance is very fractured. And we saw that in the UN Food System Summit and it needs work. That too is important, but I think the bottom up right now is, is gonna make the biggest impact in communities. Well, I would actually like to bring the session to a close. I know you, um... In principle, want to go to dinner. <laughs> Not sure you want any more after this. I surely know that you have a big task ahead of you, your generation, to look into this issue. As Professor Franzo said, that's certainly, certainly under attended so far in the climate change agenda. Mm. So it's a very important topic, which I think she very adequately or very impressively demonstrated in lots of options and lots of instruments. Thank you for that, uh, Professor Franzo. But I have a job for you. Before you leave Bologna, please leave us some guidance of what can we eat in Bologna and still enjoy Italy in particular Bologna. <laughs> Bologna is known, and I was a student once upon a time in a long ago here as La Bella 
La Rosa, because it has uh, had a leftist regime at the time, and La Casa. And many of us went here because food was so great. So your task before you leave us here, which just <laughs> bring it down a bit richly, what can we do here in Bologna? But anyhow, thank mm. you so much for this presentation today, the many dimensions so well structured and for the challenges, telling us the challenges ahead, which we indeed we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.